Hi everyone. Welcome to lesson number 15 of Growing in the Word. Today we're going to be talking about uh, the Ten Commandments and the Golden Calf. Let's begin with the introduction at the top of page 54 in your workbook. After God released his people from their slavery in Egypt and rescued them from Pharaoh's army, he prepared his people to live in the land he promised them by providing for their physical needs for the journey and giving them his law to bring them protection and order. So looking at the timeline very briefly, um, we are still right um, around the year 1446 uh, uh, BC. And then going to uh, the first of our Bible readings for today, Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 20, where God gives his people the Ten Commandments. Uh, so when uh, the people arrived at Mount Sinai, uh, God met with Moses at the top of a mountain. God gave Moses many laws for the people, but the most concise summary of God's law is found in the Ten Commandments. Um, and you'll, you'll notice here that the Ten Commandments as they're presented here are nearly identical to the Ten Commandments that we memorize from uh, the Catechism. There are some differences and we'll, we'll talk about those uh, just a, a little bit, but, but this is the giving of the Ten Commandments basically as we still memorize them today. So uh, let's uh, pause the video then and read Exodus chapter 21 through 20. Let's go to the questions. Question number one. We often group the Ten Commandments into two groups. Sometimes those two groups are called the two tables of the law or the two tablets of uh, the law because Moses uh, carried two tablets or tables of stone up the mountain. Um, and so this is one way of kind of uh, categorizing uh, the, the commandments. Uh, it doesn't literally mean that, that some commandments were written on this one tablet and then these other commandments were written on the other tablet just like this, but this is kind of an easy way kind of to uh, to remember what the commandments are about. Uh, so the first table consists of commandments one through three. Uh, the second table consists of commandments four through ten. And again, that doesn't literally mean that commandments one through three were written on one uh, tablet of stone and then four through ten on the other. Maybe uh, that's how it worked, but probably not. Um, but, but there are two kind of distinct themes uh, that we see in in the commandments. Uh, so maybe take some time, look at commandments one through three, think about those. Uh, commandments four through 10, think about those. And maybe even before we do that, we should just uh, say a little bit about the numbering of the commandments, uh, because you maybe have, have noticed and seen this out there, uh, that different Christians, different uh, denominations and churches sometimes use different uh, numbering systems for the Ten Commandments. So you, you maybe have noticed somebody is, is talking about, say, the, the Fifth Commandment, and you say, wait a second, that's not, that's not what we have as the Fifth Commandment. And uh, why is that? Well, uh, to put it simply, it's because, uh, well, as you'll see, there aren't any uh, numbers uh, in uh, in the, the Ten Commandments as God gives them. There are the verse numbers, of course, but uh, God doesn't say, and commandment number one is this, commandment number two is this. So we know there are ten, uh, but we don't know exactly um, where to divide them up. And so different groups of Christians uh, divide them up uh, differently. Um, and it's probably not worth it at this point to go through why there are those differences um, but just be aware that sometimes people have different numbering, and that's not necessarily wrong. Uh, it's certainly not uh, sinful. It's just a different way of, of dividing them up into 10 uh, distinct uh, commandments. So with that said, uh, take a look. See if you can um, 
tell what the difference is between the first few commandments and then the last of the commandments in terms of uh, what they are about, what they what they deal with. Were you able to uh, pick out some common themes uh, in those groupings of, of commandments? Uh, maybe you noticed uh, that the, the first table, the first three commandments really deal with our relationship with God. Uh, you shall have no other gods. Uh, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. That's about God's word. Uh, so we're talking about the fact that there's one true God. Uh, that we are to uh, use his name properly, that we are to hear his word frequently. Um, and so the first commandments deal with our relationship with God. And then uh, the second table, that second group of commandments, really deals with our relationships with other people. Honor your father and mother, right? Uh, don't uh, murder someone else. Don't commit adultery against your spouse. Uh, don't steal what belongs to someone else and so on. Uh, so there we're talking about how we uh, interact with other people, uh, how we are to treat other people, not treat other people. And so uh, the, the two tables of the law, the first table is about how uh, we deal with God. The second table is about how we deal with other people. And we're going to talk a lot more about this uh, next year when we talk about uh, the Ten Commandments. Uh, that's one of the, the major parts of the Catechism. And so when we dig into the Catechism itself, we'll talk a lot more about the commandments, how they're numbered, how they're divided up, what they're about, and so on. Number two, what parts of the Ten Commandments set God's people apart as worshipers of the true God? And this kind of touches on what we were talking about uh, before, but, but how did these commandments set the people apart um, under the one true God? All right, so as we uh, just talked about, uh, the first table of the law, those first three commandments, uh, they really deal with uh, the one true God. Um, so the first table of the law restricts belief and prayer and worship to, to the one true God and no one else. Uh, you are not to have any other gods. You are not to call upon the names of any other gods. You are not to worship any other gods and so on. And so uh, God's people are set apart. These Israelites uh, were being set apart. Uh, the Canaanites, they worship Baal and Molech and Asherah, uh, but you are not to worship any of those gods. The Egyptians worship uh, Horus and Osiris and Isis. You are not to worship those gods either. There is one true God. You are to uh, believe in him, pray to him, worship him uh, alone. Number three, the Ten Commandments were not simply special rules for God's people. Uh, they were blessings for the Israelite society in general. What was God protecting with the Ten Commandments? Uh, how were these laws uh, not just geared toward their religious lives, how they dealt with God, but how would these laws benefit just their, their daily lives in a, a nation, in a, a society, a group of people? How is God protecting them in that way too?
So here we're touching on that second table of the law, that second grouping of commandments, uh, where God uh, protects families, honor your father and mother, uh, protects people's lives, uh, telling them not to, to murder or hurt or harm each other, protecting marriages, um, protecting property in the second table of the law here. So this uh, would have made their lives, just their, their daily lives as a group of people, um, much better, much more blessed if uh, the families are strong, people's lives and marriages are protected, their property is secure, and so on. Uh, that, that's just going to make life a whole lot better. Uh, and so God isn't just concerned about the spiritual lives of his people, but also just their daily physical lives in this world as well. Uh, these laws are geared toward both spiritual blessings and physical blessings. Number four, we are not, we cannot be saved by obeying God's commands. And so if they don't give us heaven, uh, how are the Ten Commandments still valuable for us today? Are the Ten Commandments still valuable for us today? Uh, discuss that one. So if we can't be saved by obeying God's commandments, then why does God give us his commandments in the first place? Uh, well, there are uh, at least three reasons uh, why. Um, and, and these reasons, we're going to be talking a lot more about these too uh, next year in the Catechism. Uh, but what are the, the purposes of God's law, God's commandments? Well, first of all, uh, God gives his laws simply to keep our sinfulness under control. Um, if you know that God is against something, if you know that God punishes those uh, who do certain things, uh, then at the very least, you're probably not going to do those things quite as much, quite as often as, as you maybe would. Um, and this is true for any sort of law. Think about just the, the laws that we have in, uh, in our community or in our nation. Um, if there were no laws, if there were no police officers to enforce those laws, no judges, no prisons, um, no consequences for your actions, um, I'm guessing that people in general would, uh, would commit a whole lot more sins. Uh, there would be much more um, theft of property, probably more uh, violence, and fights and things like that, just all sorts of issues, all sorts of problems, if you can do whatever you want and, and no one's going to do anything about it. And so God gives his law for the same reason, uh, to, to keep sinfulness under control. Um, at the very least, I'm not going to do these things because I know that I might get in trouble, whether it's getting in trouble um, with the police or getting in trouble with, um, with God. Um, I'm going to try to keep myself under control. So that in and of itself is a good thing, uh, that people are kept under control. Society has law and order. You don't have to worry about uh, quite so much uh, crime and, and so on and violence. Okay, so that's, that's one good thing. Um, but then also God's commandments um, are valuable to us and useful to us because God's law shows us our sin. Um, we look at what God says. We compare that with, with our lives, with our hearts, and we realize that we haven't kept these commandments perfectly. Uh, there have been times when I have loved someone or something more than, than God. That's idolatry. We're going to talk about that uh, later on in this lesson. There have been times when I've misused God's name, when I haven't valued and treasured his word, when I haven't uh, honored and obeyed and respected my parents. So I see that I am sinful that I can't save myself. And so then I realize also that I need a savior. Um, I can't do it myself. I can't keep the law perfectly. I need someone to do it for me. And that someone, of course, is Jesus. 
And then God's commandments, God's laws are also valuable because they show us how to thank God with our lives. So when we hear the good news that Jesus has done it for us, that he kept the law perfectly in our place, that he has forgiven all of our sins uh, through his sacrifice on the cross, uh, then we naturally want to uh, show our appreciation for him. We want to thank God with what we uh, think and say and do. And so now the Ten Commandments um, show us how we can do that. How can I show my love for God? Uh, I can do it by uh, honoring him, hearing his word. I can show my love for God by obeying his representatives, my parents, and, and so on. So these are, are guides for us, showing us how God wants us to live our lives in thanks and praise. And like I said, we're going to get into this in more detail uh, next year when we talk more about the Ten Commandments. Okay, uh, let's go then to Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 32, uh, the account of the golden calf. So at God's command, Moses had put boundaries around Mount Sinai so the people wouldn't even touch it. Uh, he did this to emphasize that God is holy, the people were not. Uh, so this was an impressive, uh, a frightening thing for the people that there is this holy mountain, we're not even allowed to touch it. Uh, God descends upon this mountain in this thick cloud of fire and smoke and thunder and lightning, and there's a trumpet blast from nowhere, and the ground is shaking, and this voice booms from, from uh, the mountain with these commandments. Um, and, and if we even dare to touch the mountain, we're going to die. That's how holy God is. We can't, can't uh, approach him, can't get close to him in his holiness and power and glory. Um, and then Moses goes up the mountain uh, to speak with God. And while Moses was speaking with God, the people got antsy. Uh, they convinced Aaron, Moses' brother, to make an idol to worship. And that's what we read about here, uh, what the people are up to. Uh, when Moses goes up uh, Mount Sinai to talk uh, with God. So let's pause the video and read Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 32. All right, let's go then to uh, the questions. Question 5 says, review Exodus 20, verses 18 and 19, why were the people scared, uh, according to those verses? Why were the people uh, scared? Um, they couldn't bear to hear the voice of God. So we were just talking about how frightening this was, how intimidating uh, this was, um, that that there is this, this holy mountain uh, where God descends in his glory and power and, and thunder and, and lightning and, and smoke and fire and the ground shaking and the trumpet blast and then this voice of God himself who is is... Um, declaring these commandments, and they hear the voice of God. Uh, they hear these commandments. They realize this is a holy God speaking to us, giving us these commandments, um, and, and we haven't done these things perfectly. Um, they are, are terrified. They think that if they, they continue to hear the voice of God, that they will surely die. And they weren't necessarily wrong in thinking that. The wages of sin is death, the Bible tells us. That's that's the natural result when sinful people come into the presence of a holy, perfect, righteous, powerful God. Uh, the wages of sin is death. They have this sudden realization of how uh, small they are, how weak they are, how sinful they are, how big and powerful God is. And so they beg Moses. Uh, Moses, you go up the mountain. Uh, you listen to what God has to say. He'll talk to you, and then you can come down and pass the message on to us, but we can't bear to hear his voice anymore. Number six, Moses was up on the mountain receiving the law from God. 
um, and he was up there for uh, for 40 days, right? Uh, why did the people ask Aaron to make them a god while Moses was gone? Why did the people ask Aaron to make them a god? Well, because Moses uh, hadn't come back yet. He had been up on the mountain for a very long time, and they figured Moses probably is is gone. And it makes sense why the people would think that, right? Uh, because God had, had said, this is a holy mountain. Uh, you are not to touch the mountain uh, or climb uh, the mountain. Um, God is is there in this, this uh, fire, in, in his glory. And they probably assume, well, uh, Moses uh, probably uh, died. He went up there um, and, and he was consumed by this burning fire, um, destroyed by God's holiness. He's, he's gone. Um, he, he hasn't come down for, for days and days and days, for weeks and weeks, over a month. Um, he's, a, he's a goner, they thought. Number seven, why do you suppose that Aaron went along with their request? Why, why does Aaron do this thing that they uh, are asking him to do? Why does Aaron go along with this? Well, we're not told specifically. Um, maybe Aaron thought that this really was a good idea. Maybe he was all for it. Um, probably not, uh, though. Um, probably um, Aaron does this because he was afraid of, of the crowd. Uh, there are dozens, hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people perhaps uh, gathered around Aaron demanding this. Moses, the leader, uh, is is gone. Who knows when he's going to come back, if he ever is going to come back. Aaron is kind of uh, in charge now and the people are angry. Uh, what are they going to do if I tell them no? If I don't go along with what they're asking, are they going to kill me? Um, it, it's easier safer for Aaron just to kind of go along with this, even if he knows uh, that, that this isn't right, that this isn't good. Um, he isn't willing to stand up to the crowd, isn't willing to say, no, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Um, he goes along with the crowd because that's just uh, the easy thing to do. And, you know, there are times when we do the very same thing, right? When uh, the, the crowd uh, around us, when, when our group of friends maybe um, wants to do something and we know this is not right, this is wrong, I shouldn't be doing this, but man, it's hard to stand up and say no. It's easy just to kind of go along um, and try to convince yourself that maybe it's okay. Um, and that's what Aaron does here. Number eight, where would they likely have gotten the gold to make this calf? Review lesson uh, 14 from last time. Read Exodus 12, 35 to 36 to uh, remind yourselves if you, you uh, don't recall what we talked about there in lesson 14. Where does all this gold come from? So we, uh, we talked about last time uh, how the Egyptians 
uh, gave the Israelites their gold and silver and clothing and supplies and all of these things just to get them to go. Uh, you know, Israelites, uh, we can't we can't um, risk you being here anymore. We can't risk that God is going to kill all of us like he killed the firstborn. Just take what you want and go. And uh, it seems that the Israelites then use uh, this gold or some of the gold that they had gotten from the Egyptians to make uh, this this idol. The Egyptians gave them gold when they were leaving. All right, number nine, what bizarre claim did the people make about the calf that Aaron had literally just made? So what do the people say about this calf? They claim that this calf was a god who had brought them out of uh, Egypt. Uh, maybe they think, maybe Aaron thinks that this makes it okay. Um, you know, we're still worshiping the Lord. We're still worshiping that same God who saved us and brought us out of Egypt. We're just worshiping him in a different way, in a different form as a, a, a calf and so on. Um, you could understand maybe why they, they want a god that has this visible form that they can can see uh, because that's what the Egyptians had. The Egyptians had lots and lots of different gods, um, lots and lots of idols. You know, the, the, the Egyptians had gods that had forms that you could, could see. Um, and so, you know, it, this makes them like, like the, the people around them, um, that they now have a, a god that they can, can see and worship in this visible uh, form. Number 10, what did God say that he would do to the people? So what does God say that he's going to do to the people? Uh, he's going to wipe them out. Uh, he is going to destroy the people, destroy the Israelites, and, and start over, basically. Uh, he's going to make Moses' descendants into a great nation instead. Um, and maybe this seems uh, drastic, but uh, I, I think uh, we can understand why God would, would do this, because he had literally just told the people from Mount Sinai, um, this this thunderous voice from the mountain, the very first thing that he said to them basically was, uh, you shall have no other gods. You are not supposed to make idols. And the very first thing that the people do is to uh, make an idol, make another god for themselves. Uh, the very first commandment that God gives to them, they they uh, break uh, right away in, in the very obvious and and sinful way. Um, and so God uh, has had it with them. Um, uh, he's going to destroy them, wipe them out, and uh, make Moses' descendants into a nation uh, instead. Number 11, why did Moses object to that idea? There are a few reasons why Moses said, no, Lord, uh, you can't do that. Uh, see if you can find those there in, in verses 11 through 13. So Moses uh, prays for the people. He intercedes uh, for uh, the people. 
Um, and, and there are a couple of points that he makes to God. First of all, it would go against the promises that God had made to the people, the promises that God had been making all the way back to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob uh, to make their descendants into uh, a great nation. God had promised the Israelites uh, that he would uh, protect them, preserve them, bring them safely to uh, the promised land. And so God would really be breaking uh, the promises that he had made. Um, and then another point that Moses makes is that this would cause people to ridicule God. Uh, what uh, a terrible God these Israelites uh, have. Uh, their God uh, saved them from slavery, brought them safely through the, the Red Sea, and then he just killed them all in the desert. Uh, how foolish this God is. Um, and, and so Moses is concerned about the people. Moses is concerned about God and his reputation uh, among uh, the, the nations and peoples of uh, the world. And so he, he prays for the people, intercedes uh, for them. Uh, number 12, what did Moses do in anger when he went down and saw the festival that the people were celebrating to this false God, this false uh, Lord? What does Moses do? Um, he, he sees what the people are doing, sees it for himself with his own eyes, um, and he smashes these tablets of stone. Uh, he burns this, this idol that they had made. Uh, he puts the ashes into the water. He makes the people uh, drink it. Moses is not happy uh, at all. Um, he, he has prayed for the people, asked God to forgive them, but um, there are still serious consequences for uh, what the people have done. Number 13, evaluate Aaron's excuses. When Moses confronts his brother Aaron, how in the world could you let this happen? Um, what does Aaron say? Do you think they're good excuses or, or maybe not so good? So to be perfectly honest, uh, Aaron's excuses are pretty terrible, right? Uh, Aaron does not take responsibility uh, for what he has done. Aaron doesn't repent of his terrible sin. Aaron blames others. Uh, the people made me do it. Um, I, I wasn't in control uh, of this at all. I put the gold in and just, wow, out came this calf. Um, what a crazy coincidence. Um, pretty, pretty lame. Uh, pretty cowardly on Aaron's part. Number 14, what did Moses ask God to do in verse 32? So Moses once again intercedes for the people um, and asks God to uh, forgive them for this, this terrible sin. And God does uh, forgive them. He doesn't destroy them all, wipe them all out and, and start over, even though he would have been perfectly justified in, in doing so. Uh, he forgives the people. And then number 15, how do we often behave like the Israelites did in this Seen. See the first commandment. The first commandment is printed there for you, um, middle of page 56. Uh, read through that um, and then answer the question, how do we behave like they did? I don't think that any of us uh, has a, a golden calf 
uh, in our homes that we bow down to and worship. At least I, I sure hope that you don't have a golden calf in your living room uh, that you're worshiping. Um, but that doesn't mean that we are, are not guilty of this same sort of, of sin. So read through the first commandment. See, um, see how we sometimes do the same thing, just in different ways. So what does the first commandment uh, tell us? Uh, you shall have no other gods. What does that mean? Uh, well, it means that we should fear, uh, honor, respect, uh, love, and trust in God above all things. And whenever we don't fear or love or trust God above everything else, we are committing idolatry. Uh, when we put other things or other people above God in our lives, uh, we are committing idolatry because whatever is first in your life, whatever is, is the number one most important thing in your life, that is your God. Um, and so it, it's worth thinking about our lives, the way that we live our lives, the things that we do, the priorities uh, that we have. Um, to determine what is the most important thing in my life. What do I spend most of my time doing? Uh, what do I spend most of my time thinking about? Um, what do I spend my money on? Um, when there are two things on the calendar at the same time, which one do I choose over uh, the other? Um, and when we do that, I think we realize uh, that we have lots of things uh, that we put above God. People have lots of idols today. Uh, even if they don't take the form of, of golden calves, uh, people have lots of idols, lots of things that they put above God. Uh, maybe it's family or work or school or money or possessions, vehicles, uh, vacations, uh, sports, activities, hobbies, whatever it might be, all of those things can be idols, just as serious, just as bad as the golden calf, when those things come before God and uh, his word. And so uh, we talked before at the beginning of this lesson how God's law shows us our sin. Uh, well, that's exactly what God's law is doing here. Um, it shows us our sin so that we can repent of that sin. So um, for all of those times when we've put other things above God, when other things have been more important to us in life, um, we need to repent of those things um, and uh, ask God for, for forgiveness, or receive that forgiveness through word and sacrament, which we uh, receive uh, at, at church. Okay, uh, let's look at the key questions then. Uh, A, what benefit did the Ten Commandments serve for God's people in the Old Testament? Uh, well, uh, through the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law that God gave to them, uh, the people learned God's will for their lives, what he wanted them to do and not do. Uh, they learned that they were sinful, that they needed a Savior. They learned how they could thank God for saving them. God had saved them from slavery in Egypt, um, saved them from Pharaoh and his army uh, in the, the Red Sea. Uh, God had saved them, and he reminds them of that, right? At the very beginning, uh, right before he even gives them the commandments, he says, I am the Lord who uh, brought you up out of Egypt. Um, and so now the people, um, you know, they, they failed in this, of course, but the people, um, they, they had this, this system, they had these guidelines for how they could live their lives to thank God for saving them from, from slavery. All right, uh, B, what benefit do the Ten Commandments serve for God's people today? Uh, we receive the very same benefits today. Uh, the Ten Commandments, they teach us um, what God wants us to do and not do. They show us that uh, we sin against God and we need uh, a Savior from sin. They show us how we can live our lives uh, to thank God for saving us, not just from slavery in Egypt, but uh, saving us from our slavery to 
uh, sin and death. And then C, uh, though God gave constant reminders of his presence and love, what did the Israelites ask Aaron to do for them while Moses was on Mount Sinai? Well, sadly, uh, they asked Aaron to make them another God, uh, a replacement God. Um, they, they sinned against the first commandment. Okay, uh, homework assignment for next time. Catechism memory work. Please memorize the first commandment. It's very short and yet very important. Um, you should be able to, to memorize that pretty easily, so please commit that uh, to memory. Uh, no Bible passages this time. Uh, be able to answer the key questions that we just went through for Lesson 15. Then you can read pages 33 to 52 in Luther's Catechism. That's all about the first commandment, how we sometimes um, make idols for ourselves uh, in life. Okay, um, that does it for this lesson, Lesson 15, as always. Please feel free to get in touch with me if you have any comments or concerns or, or questions. Uh, but otherwise, have a wonderful day and God's blessings to all of you.